guess he just hit us with the Ricky Bobby. If you ain't first, you're last. <laughs> well, that's ridiculous, Casey. You can be second, third, fourth. Heck, you can even be fifth. No, those are all last. I just heard you could be last, last, last. Heck, even last. That's what I heard. All right. Well, I haven't lived my whole life by that. <laughs> but looking at uh, the matchups down below, the Divine Shield thing over the class means it's been protected. Uh, we're in Shield Phase Conquest, so you protect one of your decks from being banned prior to a ban phase. So it's it's uh, always an option that you can have in that one. And both players, like our last matchup, they've shielded their Quest Druid, and they've banned away the opposing Shaman. Yeah, seems to be a pattern that's emerging. Uh, clearly, we've heard a player or two come up on their interview now and say, yeah, I think Quest Shaman, Quest Druid, I think those are the, the big gainers in terms of... Um, decks that profited from the nerfs to everything else. And I think perhaps mo even more respect to Quest Shaman than I would have expected coming in. I thought there would be a lot of it just in terms of players bringing it. I didn't expect it to be receiving as many bans as it has been coming on the other side. Yeah, I, I think some of it might just be because the matchup um, is kind of tricky. Like when you build a lineup that's focused on defeating, you know, like soft targeting two decks, for instance, which I think is what a lot of this format's about, you end up looking down and going, wow, I'm just really weak to Quest Shaman. Like, I just don't have anything to do against it. So we're starting off with a Druid Mirror match between Boar Control and Casey. And pretty good opening hand for both players, honestly. Casey's a little bit slower, but, you know, Crystal Merchant, I think, is a card that's very important early on in the matchup. Yep. It's kind of what led in part to the slower pace that we had in the previous series with Bunny Hopper versus Fino is that both players had both Crystal Merchants buried deep in their deck. In fact, it ended up being the card that needed to be drawn to activate the Highlander cards for both players. Um, so having an early Crystal Merchant just accelerates the game so much faster just because of the A card draw that that can provide. Standard. Casey hits the natural mistake. He must be talking about the speed of Boar's play here. I mean, he knows what Boar's going to do. No yeah. one. Nothing. Boar just hero powers. I mean. <laughs> at the end of the game, he's at one and lethal's Casey exactly. We're like, whoa! 3-2 innovate nothing? Yeah. I think there is more than one play that turn. Yeah, I mean, Innervate is exactly the card that changes some of that dynamic. And this, for board control, is important because this allows him exactly to contest. Yeah, the exactly. I was, when you said, you know, he knows what he's going to do, he's going to do nothing. I was like, no, I think generating a Panther here has a lot of merit for this exact reason. I just gave a whole spiel about how Crystal Merchant can really accelerate the pace of the game. And that's exactly why you see board control using a resource like Power of the Wild, just to get a Panther on board, is so he could contest Crystal Merchant and not have it snowball the game away. I think that is a very, very nice hidden play from board control there, which like, you know, 99% of the viewers would not have. Board control is the one player that I feel like is not the inverse, but is exemplary of the inverse of what Bunny Hopper does, where Bunny Hopper has extremely good macro game plans. I think War Control has extremely good micro game plans. Like, so many times I look at one of War's hands and I go, wow, this just doesn't do as much as I want it to do. And then I look down at a one, two, uh, you know, back to back couple turns and it just goes, whoa, it makes so much sense. Like, he is so good at that aspect of the game. Oh, okay. Second Wrath, not really what Ball was looking for with the first one already in hand. They'll just be happy he can take care of this Crystal Merchant while he's awaiting something to do. Double Nourish now means that he is going to start popping off sooner rather than later, but Casey is just that half turn ahead. Yeah, he's got a bit of his own pop off here. Casey, though, fills up his hand. Kind of talking about the list for both players. Casey is on at least the Enlightened with King Ferris. And Boar Control is on Chef Nomi with King Ferris. Casey tempos the Zephyrus. Wow. So we saw how important that was. When you wish for the perfect card, and the perfect card is a Bloodfen Raptor. <laughs> Just threw up my whole train of thought. <laughs> we saw the importance of Zephyrus in the last matchup with handling Chef Nomi. Yep. Casey does not have that ability anymore. Oh. 
which means he is pretty much locked in to being the aggressor here. He has to be the one making boards that Vor can't answer because if it does come down to final board, the lack of a Zephyrus, which, you know, as we saw in the previous game, not having one Zephyrus can potentially mean that you don't have three Zephyrus when it comes to floops and then duplicating those floops. Oh, this matchup is awesome. There's just so much stuff happening. It is really way. fun, yeah. The, the mirror in particular, I just, I, I do enjoy. Which is weird because I think generally mirrors are uh, considered to be like some of the least exciting matchups for, because both players kind of do the same thing. You get this weird stalemate. Like both players want to be in the same position because they're the same deck. There's no like jockeying back and forth for position or anything like that. But for some reason, the quest of mirror, like, I think it's just, you know, like, it's just a, such a rocky fight of a matchup. It's just two absolute unit heavyweight boxers <laughs> just throwing the most ridiculous haymakers at each other. So it's like wrestling. No. I was going to hope that it sat with you on the wrestling part. No, it didn't. So I'm afraid that's a miss. So it's like two heavyweights, but not like two wrestlers. OK. Yeah. I'll have to take some time to understand that. I see. When you are a refined gentleman, such as myself, Admirable, you understand that true professional wrestling is much more than two big heavyweight people. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't an all like a mirror match. One of them has Chef Nomi, the other one doesn't. I mean, it's also a good point. Yeah. I think we, we saw the dynamic based on like which of those cards you choose to include. I think it encapsulated perfectly in the previous series. But the big difference here is that Casey cannot assume the role that Bunny Hopper assumed in the previous series because he's just he's had to commit his Zephyrus to the board to not burn a card. Yeah, something that's uh, kind of interesting to me though is that um, Casey's been like he like he just didn't play King Ferris, and I think a lot of that has to do with specifically the Warrior with Bodhi. Mm -hmm. uh, staying hidden. He's trying to force out AOE or trying to force out the War Druid Lodi to come out from hiding. In the meantime, spending a lot of spells to get it done. Also, somewhat interesting in that spot there. If, if that's truly part of your goal, I wonder if uh, expending the 5-5 five five in that situation um, buys you anything. You know, because you have the 7-9 in play, perhaps that forces it out of hiding or forces more spells. That's a good point. Side. Yeah. You know, I, I imagine the plan for Casey is to get some value from Hidden Oasis in the event that this lives. Right. Probably. The 7-9 specifically, maybe not, just because, like, 9 lines up so well against the Starfall anyway yeah. with the spell damage in play. Um, like, it's a good thought. It's definitely worth thinking about, but I think specifically against the uh, the Stealth Loti with Starfall being a possibility. I think value trading the nine makes sense just because it's such a perfect number for Starfall. Yeah, there's a lot going on in this matchup. I'm glad I get to witness it instead of experience it right now. Because what I'm going to do is learn what they're doing and then go inflict that on others. <laughs> <laughs> we get to do it in reverse. <sighs> Anubis, he's like, the, the, the five, the, the five two's just sitting there. Sorry, I got distracted by Billy there for a second. Billy, if you're not aware, is Paul's cap. I should say one of Paul's two cats, the more social one that you will actually see on camera every now and again. Yeah. going to be rooted and up or does this drag the earth with it? Yeah. yeah that's precisely what happened. <laughs> doesn't uproot. <laughs> just digs out of the ground. <laughs> just All the earth around just rips up in one motion. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Time waits for no one. It did seem like the choice. I mean, we've reached a point now where the like Ancient of Law went from being a card that was considered so good it had to be nerfed to the nerf happening, and like I'm looking at that and like even with both of those effects going <laughs> off at the same time, I still don't think that's a good card. You're like, yeah, nah. Yeah. That's not for me. Nah, I'm good, fam. I'll take the 10-10. Keeping the wardrobe with Lodi hidden is so powerful. It's so powerful in so many matchups as well. Wrath is just two mana deal six. Yep. Like TJ and I were playing uh, Quest Rue versus Quest Shaman yesterday, just because again they're the, like the two hot new tickets in the in the meta game, so we wanted to get a good handle on them. And I was playing from the Quest Shaman side most of the time, and it's just such a terror to just, like, I ended up having to, like, Plague of Murlocs their Loti so I could start developing boards and garbage like that. Like, it's so frustrating if you're, like, playing any kind of deck that wants to build a board, if they just sit a spell damage minion in stealth on the board. How do you develop into that without just throwing resources into the Aether? I don't know. Just seems tough. What to do? It's the first playable stealth spell damage that we've had in Hearthstone. Yeah, it, it just takes you, it just requires you to pick all of the effects on it <laughs> <laughs> to get it there. Coincidentally, that's the Druid quest. Yeah. What? The entire one was Mini Mage, I believe. Four mana, four, four one, one stealth. stealth? Yeah. yeah, I remember that guy. Yikes. Time waits for no one. Yeah, but I feel Boar's turn here. It's not really much progress, I think, to be had. Just everything's kind of uh, it's just, just not enough, it feels like. Right. So it looks like you're staying put. This is one of the first turns, I think, that Boar's nose is open. And it might hurt a lot. Something for Casey to think about, though, is the perhaps diminishing effect of King Ferris. That is actually a pretty huge hmm. factor. Like, Swipe Starfall was just an absolutely insane clear here. But one, that's two AoEs used on one board, which is generally not a way you want to go about it because the, the AoEs are so precious to keep pushing damage. Secondly, yeah, it makes your King Ferris pretty bad in that spot. But Casey says, you know what? I think with that Druid of the Claw coming in behind this, and with uh, the Flute in hand representing more damage on top of that as well, he thinks that's good enough to just start pushing. That's a lot of damage. Yep. Finally revealed. The crouching tiger, dragon, dinosaur, lizard is no longer hidden. Try to play Hearthstone. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That turn was, that was just mega. It's one of those giga turns the kids are talking about. Oh yeah. 13 on board, four more from the Druid of the Claw, three more from the flute behind that as well. 20 damage. Just didn't play King Ferris this game. That's so weird. He's just played all his mid range stuff so far. Like his big bombs, like he's thrown Zephyrus away as a Bloodfen Raptor. He's thrown away all his spells, so King Ferris hasn't isn't gonna be a huge blowout. He's just played mid rangey stuff and just kept the board because of it. That's not to say the boar is out of this game. It absolutely isn't. I would suspect the boar is very, very close to turning the corner here and restabilizing as long as he can deal with the next couple of threats. Yeah, Nubisat's not really the card you want to copy. I imagine uh, Casey had a big spell in mind. What to do? 
doesn't want to duplicate the bees. Yeah, I was gonna say, I don't think there's any reason to play Elise first there, because as you said, he doesn't want the bees duplicated, so why run that risk? Burn his next card. Not really much of consequence left, I don't believe. Admittedly, I have not done perfect tracking on this, but I think a bunch of scenarios is in hand. I mean, he can just, he, he has an opportunity to slam two scenarios in a row or slam a scenarios and then slam four scenarios. Right. Or two more after that. Like there's, there's so much threat that board controls under. This is the one turn where Board does just have a little bit of leniency to do whatever he chooses. It seems like 5 6 rushes plus hidden oasis is his best combination this turn. I guess the question is do you oasis yourself or do you oasis the surger? I think you oasis yourself? I think. This is just purely based on what we saw last game, where it like seems that fatigue ticks can actually come in extremely important when it comes down to the last few turns of the game. Maybe I'm overestimating the value of it. Well, the scenario certainly doesn't look as good here. What to do? Who did? Good enough, though. It's going to have to be a two-turn setup. Yeah, I think it's about what Casey has right now, is just play a bunch of scenarios for the rest of the game. Does that mean Borg gets an opportunity to push back? Of course, Boar unaware of the Druid of the Claw that was discovered as well and then duplicated, which is representing eight damage from hand whenever Casey wants it. So Boar probably within his rights to play a little bit recklessly in a couple of spots that might just end up getting him killed here to the eight damage burst. What to do? Yeah, I see this game, and both no have so many minions. <laughs> like I, I just want—I want a savage roar in the deck. I mean, there are effects like it in the deck. There are the scenarios, of course, and also the power of the wild that we saw Ball Control use early in respect to that crystal merchant that can have that kind of effect. But yeah, like I said, this is just kind of what Casey has right now. He just has a bunch of scenarios. It's, it's pretty good. Is it good enough? If not, you've got to go back and look at the aggression from Casey, the, you know, filling up your hand and just choosing to play a Bloodfen Raptor instead of burning, you know, whatever, a random card off the top could have been anything. Swipes. You've got to look at using all spells before getting any value out of King Ferris. These are all things that need to be examined. So he's just going to go one scenario at a time in his game plan is to leverage against the fatigue clock. I guess so. What to Wow, that does provide a, a pretty substantial amount of uh, power against Boar's particular hand. It's just the way that the momentum shifts. Like, Boar has to respect the overwhelming power that a Scenarius can provide. And so, he has to go for this tool right here, swipes off the board and says, all right, you deal with it. Yep. And here's the problem. Casey's kind of got himself into... You have to scenarios first. You cannot add Drew to the Claw in scenarios because that's a fluke version. Yep. So I believe it's Anubisath Defender in that case. And that means that Zephyrus cannot enter the board because Boar Control cannot eliminate enough of his own minion. 
No, but he does just simply trade over everything, and he's still alive on the following turn. He's then representing the 42 hmm. on the turn after, which is not enough. Okay. This could actually just get a little bit awkward because that Zephyrus ends up being with being unplayable. Can you Starfall your own minion? No. I believe you can. Can you? Feels five to your oh, own. To a minion. minion and then two to all enemies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. And then the Zephyrus uh, makes an offer here, which is Savage Roar. I believe. Savage Roar because he's playing wow. three remaining. Oh, that is beautiful. I like that. Lightning nope. Storm. That's is that enough still? No. It's thirty six. Assuming he hasn't attacked with any other six six yet. Which so he hasn't. If Savage Roar was not lethal, it would not offer it. I what sometimes do? correct. And so that's the, the break point there. So Savage Roar would have dealt twenty four plus eight. So it would have dealt thirty two damage. Yes. Fair enough. Actually deals more damage? No, it deals less technically, but it did keep you from having to trade off a bunch of your board. Yeah, the stuff of your own minion was the crucial part of that turn though from Ball. Where shall I strike? Because it's enabled the situation where he did potentially have wow. lethal over two. King Ferris just not played from either end. Not played on either end, end yeah. That's so weird. Uh, yeah. Play. War does go over the line. Six health to spare, but you only need one. Plenty of damage coming through the other way, but if he hadn't have seen that line with uh, Starfalling your own minion, which I apparently would have missed, then he gets into a situation where over two turns, just from Casey putting up little torn roadblocks, he doesn't necessarily represent that lethal over two turns. Um, and on the second turn, he can then kill one of his six sixes by trading it into a second minion. But at that point, it's not necessarily good enough to push through really lethal. So recognizing it that he had to do it there by Starfalling his own minion was very, very, very clutch yeah, indeed. Good enough. Seems to be a very typical boar thing. Like, hey, <laughs> that's how it works. Druid's looking good. You don't have to worry about Galaxy just blowing you out of the water anymore. Yeah, I mean, we made the point at the start, but this really has what opened what has opened up the meta to these kind of decks coming in. You see, that deck is all about just like survive for a bit, and then in the late game, I do all of these insane things, but I do them turn after turn after turn. Whereas when Pocket Galaxy was in the game at five mana, that happened so early that Druid never got to the point where it was able to do all these ridiculously explosive things because Mage was already doing ridiculously explosive things on turn six and turn seven. One mana Kalagos, one mana Antonidas, Alex Straza, you down to 15, play Stargazer Lunar. I now have my whole deck in my hand and it all costs one. Like that happens too quickly. And it's so, it's so final in terms of just being able to blow anything out of the game that all these other late game win conditions just weren't really playable. So now we're seeing late game win conditions like Quest Shaman, Quest Druid, etc. have a lot more wiggle room in the metagame. Yeah, indeed. And it's looking very strong so far. So I'm curious to see how players are going to, you know, adapt to that next week because right now this is it's like Druid week, it feels like. It's almost so many people have it. And then Quest Shaman as well. Uh, the Shaman, we have yet to really see perform them. So question mark about that one uh, is what I have so far. Still early on in the week here for uh, for Grandmasters, though. So we got to go to a quick break. When we come back, we're going to jump into game number two of Casey taking on board control. Our match of the day. Stay tuned. Oh. <laughs> 
My name is Francisco Fraile Montas, one of my best friends came out with my nickname. We are all getting like nicknames with three letters for some reason, like 13 years old. My name is Francisco and Francisco is called Pancho, so it's just like three letters from that P and C. One interesting thing about me that most people don't know is that I used to study ancient history. I quit for Hearts in a couple of years, but plan on going back at one point. My favorite Hearts tournament for a moment was when I topped the Lethal 2016 Copa America Finals. That was like my first big win and I was very, very happy. It's like finally all that I worked for coming true. Being Grandmasters for me means that all the hard work that I put in last years and all the time that I spent, I spent the game is paying off. My favorite thing about Grandmasters would be that I get a chance to prove myself like on the big stage. What makes me unique as a player, I would say is just bringing very complicated decks to tournament, like mostly combo decks that people usually don't play. My personal goals this year would be to earn as much money as I can, of course, and yes, improve as a player and play the best I can. Week two of the Hearthstone Grandmasters for the European Reach. And I'm Nathan, that's Admirable Zamora. I'm joined by Simon Sato Welch in our match of the day right now, our fourth match that's taken place. Spore Control up to a 1 0 lead in a Quest Druid Mirror match. And Sato, I feel like that game was so weird to me because both of them just had King Ferris in their hand at the end of the game. Yeah, it was a very. Crucial turn for Casey, where he just kind of had to use every expensive spell in his hand as removal because Bor had got ahead on the board and pushed, and that let him with left him with just kind of this neutered King Ferris in his hand that wasn't really doing anything. And then, of course, he duplicates it, so he has two neutered King Ferris in his hands that don't do anything. And like I kept saying, he was just stuck, just playing a Scenarius every turn, which, as powerful as that card is in Choose Both form, it's rarely good enough against, you know, what a full selection of quest druid cards on the other hand can do. That's so weird to me. You're like, oh, what happened? Oh, I played a Scenarius every single turn for the rest of the game that chose both modes. I wasn't good enough. Yeah, well, I mean, if I frame that in the context that your opponent played seven six sixes in one turn, does that sound more reasonable? <laughs> I, no, it sounds like they played seven six sixes in one turn. That doesn't sound reasonable at all. That's what I'm saying. Anyway, we're moving into <laughs> loftier territory now for the Quest Druid. This is the matchup that I really think, you know, a lot of these Quest Druids were looking to have in the bank with how greedy they're being built. Multiple Nomis, multiple uh, Floops, multiple Elise, like whatever they can get done to just have this huge late game power to this beat all the Brawls and Plague of Wraths that Warrior might have to throw at them. War Control matching the pace of Casey as well. Look at this one, two, three curve that Boar had. Is this a secret paladin? Hey. It's just the, the butterfly meme. <laughs> <laughs> Is this secret paladin? Yeah. What now? King Ferris with six spells in your hand. Is this a dead card? <laughs> yeah, it actually is. It's 
So I wonder how much Boar is just thinking here, well, I have a one, two, three curve and one of these what cards costs now? four. Counter argument, it's really terrible. <laughs> Apologies for the spectator issue here. We're going to get this fixed as quickly as we can. Thank you for being patient with us. We apologize for that. Um, but opted for the Zilliax uh, is what I saw. In Did he? I didn't even see a resolve yeah. where he picked. Yeah, I think it was between the Zilliax and the Frightened Flunky. I think if there was like a, a stronger option for Curve, he might have picked it because I think that is something that you do want to look to do as the Warrior is try and get some early aggression going where you can. And with the Dream 1-2-3 Curve um, going up to Snip Snap, and potentially just picking up something there to keep pushing was beneficial, but it, when it was when it's a one six, like I don't think that really enters into the equation. So it's whether he yep. wanted the rebuy with the frightened flunky or just the, the security of one of the best cards in the game, and Zilliax. You know I love me some rebuys. So that's a second frightened flunky he's drawn. Snip snap connected to the Eternium Rover. Zilliax connects to that. Just representing damage, representing aggression. It's about all he can do. Because if it does come down to removal versus threats, the threats are going to win on the Druid side. Woo! Wrath, I think a pretty necessary pickup here for Casey. Job done. And boy, what a world we're living in where you take Mark of Nature off of a discovery <laughs> effect. Yep, chill with Mechie. Say go. It's maximum pressure every turn. <laughs> that is going to get shut down pretty dang quick. Yeah, it doesn't look like a super efficient turn. And for Casey, you know, he's shaking his head about it. But that gets the job done. It just stops damage on the other end. Yep. Like it brick walls it, and then you get a chance to recover. This place is scary. So for Boar, I imagine Plague of Wrath has got to be pretty I, interesting. Yes, yeah. My eyes lit up when I saw it. It represents damage being pushed. It would be the final push. It would be an all-in bet on your opponent not having any AoE this turn. But maybe it's the best you have in the matchup. for six that way. You do. He's gonna slow it down. Like Rath's too powerful. Can't get rid of it that way. I can totally understand that too. You have Dr. Boot Mad Genius in hand. And you know, two out of the five hero powers connect wonderfully Job when you done. use Plague Wrath as the option. You also yeah. have to consider how your turn looks against the Starfall. It would look miserable. That's, yeah, that's kind of what I said. Like, you're making an all-in bet against no AoE from the opponent. Like, if Starfall comes down and you've just used a Plague of Wrath, you kind of have zero game left at that point. Like, you are just conceding to Starfall there. Well, I imagine Casey's got some pretty powerful turns. So at least duplicate your hand at random when the effect happens. Does King Ferris summon at random, or does he summon from left to right? I believe it's the same as Elise. I'm so Potentially immediate payoff. Casey not taking the bait. Doesn't really need to. Ooh, not the best mechs. Weirdly, Casey is the one that can kind of afford to just have this one go long. Just get some ridiculous value set up in his hand with the Elise. When your mechs have rush, that card looks a lot better. Yeah. Whoa. I 
think Boar responsible there and Shield Slam gets the clear board, gives himself maximum opp opportunity because he is going to have to spend 10 on playing that thing. Well, he's at 41 and I'm looking at two Wardens in the deck. If he draws a two Warden, what? that thing's insane. Yes. Who dares to Casey commits. He'd love to get super greedy here, but I think he recognizes that passing a turn is just not really where he wants to be. He wants to keep up the threat for as long as he possibly can. I think that's the one problem this deck can run into is that it, it does have some issue spacing out its threats. It can do a lot of things in totality, um, but honestly, the best way to beat Control Warrior, and this, this has been true be for like five for years, is to, to do something strong every turn. Like if you take one turn off and allow them just to, example, play an Emerus, for 10 mana without having pressure on them. That's suddenly when they can actually set up situations where they can use inefficient tools to then take care of boards that you make after that. If you keep up the pressure and just make them continue to have to play removal from hand, you will exhaust their removal, but it has to be constant pressure. It has to be consistent pressure. Yeah, and that pressure, I think that's what Boar's weighing up right now. Oh, I love that news thing. You know, Shield Slam and the Super Collider looks so good. The issue with it is that you're not really accomplishing what you want to with a play like that. You just have nine mana left overwards, and you <laughs> left afterwards, and you go, what do I do? Yeah, I think Boar is interested uh, not only in keeping the board state clear, but I think with the Emrys, like two board is your big payoff. But like, I think you have to hold it for that if you're going to do a play like that. Yeah, I can definitely see that being the case. Of the sounds. Casey just about finds himself and gets some gas there. Otherwise, it was about to be a fairly weak turn. Boar's confused by the positioning. It looked like I don't know. Looked fine to me. I want the Crystal Merchant. Oh, you want the Crystal Merchant to be alive? Yeah, I do. If you're in Casey's position. No, no, he Oh, he's not the one with Nomi. Yeah, I, I was, was going to say... I put my deck list in the wrong spot. I was, I was firing up the outlandish thing that Admirable says scales for a second. So, I, I had the deck list on the right. Ah, uh, I gotcha, 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 gotcha. That's my bad. Yeah. I think that is just a mistake in terms of positioning from Casey. Ball control recognized it. Casey only caught on a few seconds later, but did eventually catch on. It's just sloppy play. And after I defended him last week for being able to play quickly without playing sloppy. How could you let me down like this, Casey? Everybody makes mistakes. That's why they put racers on pencils. <laughs> um... Well, that's like probably bottom 2% of possible. Well, no, there's a vicious scrap pound in it. Bottom 10% of possible Omega assemblies. I'm thinking like Alarma bot, Skater bot. There's got to be another if terrible. In your wildest fantasies. Oh, Goblin Bomb. If in go. your wildest fantasies, the three worst mech. Well, I've got a lisp now. The three worst mechs that you can name, one of them's actually in there. Yeah, it's pretty bad. I mean, they already have Rush. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, well, Skaterbot can give something Rush. Oh, great. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> this would be great be for when they change Dr. Boom's uh, Rush mechanism to give all your Rush minions plus one attack. Yeah. <laughs> Spoiler alert, that's not happening. Oh, I love that At least I don't think it is. I don't know. The old 814 Armegadillo. <laughs> you go, please don't kill this with your 4-6 points. <laughs> Casey has a lot of interest in setting up the Elise to be super powerful. And you can see that the hand size issues do make that tough to do. Yeah. Hmm, I wonder. He 
He's also now, this is just coming down to final resources, trying to be very careful not to give big value over to a Brawl or, play, or Plague of Wrath from uh, from Ball Control, but how does he know that there's only a a, uh, a Plague of Wrath in hand that's very hard to activate for more at the moment? Yeah, the single top minion the way does that. Oh, I wonder, are you supposed to play Crystal Merchant and then the Black Knight? So that way you have the Flute Black Knight option? That's a good point. Oh, yeah. interesting. I think you're probably right. Why not have the option, right? You're certainly not going to want to play a Fluped Crystal Merchant next turn. Yeah, I kind of don't want to Flute anything yet. Hmm. Right. But, like, the option of a card that you might want to play is still better than one that you are never going to want to yeah, play. Yeah, it's like, you know, maybe things work out perfectly. Yeah. Maybe it's just an insurance policy on his Zephyrance sequencing. Yeah, because you can still play it the other way around after you pick the Black Knight off the Zephyrus. Hmm. That was a really ugly <laughs> One Dynomatic Omega Devastator, anything of that. Just has so much more removal power this turn. One of these is not gonna, yeah, I was gonna say, Innovate needs to come out first, or else one of these can potentially not get duplicated, and that could potentially be King Ferris. Oh, I see what's happening. He gets to spend, spend, spend on spells, perhaps. Oh, he just got so much gas. Actually, yep. yeah, this is, this is gonna be ridiculous. I don't think Bork can get out of this spot. Like, it's gonna take a lot of AoE drawn, because Casey's about to make about 17 boards in a row. Yep. And that's a problem. Hmm. Two Faris, two Floops. That's four board in a can. It's right off the bat. And then he has follow-ups to that with more 6-6s six and Anubisaths afterwards. Bor just keeps opening up the can. He's like, why is there's, this? There's another King Faris in here. He's like, well, stop opening the can then. Why do I keep being surprised? This you knew it was going to happen. The third the can player. happened in a row. Uh, certainly not doing the fourth one. Yeah, he's in trouble. The mega assemblies were just so weak. It's crazy, too. Like, something as simple as having two Mordens in hand with that Emerus could have changed this. Yeah, would have made an impact. I don't know if it would have been a game-winning impact. It certainly would have helped. You just keep playing Elise's too. More. So the thing about it is the Elise is a random generation. So he gets two cards at random. over. Yeah, he had it last turn as well. Yeah, but he's in fatigue now. What was last turn? Was it a mistake to keep that around? Hmm. Has he had options to trade? I mean, I guess he will have had at some point, but like recently has he had an option to turn. trade that into something? Oh, it's, it was a 3-6. I don't know. Interesting. That's going to start adding up quick, though. It is. 3 plus 3 plus 5 plus 1 adds up quick on the opponent as well. Oh, I'm thinking the Zilliax here. That doesn't work very well. No, this it doesn't. This would be a good time for a master plan. Yeah, I'm back to Warpath. Yeah, I mean, Boar's out is to just continue to stave off the damage. 
and like the fatigue set in. Yeah, I mean, ideally you look this for a way to like take a large amount of damage off the board this turn while leaving the Crystal Merchant alive to kind of work as a covert operative for you, but that's just not a possibility whatsoever. Oh, I love that fuse thing. Covert operative Crystal Merchant. Well, actually, two Warpaths and a Zilliax. Could technically, right? This works as well. This works as well, and you preserve the wall path. Okay, yeah, very, very similar. Like, because you took all the damage off the board. Yeah, very similar end game. It's just you use a wall path to kill a three-one in the play. I was suggesting. I think a wall path is worth more than a three-one in this situation, so that does make sense. I like it. Oh, that's a lot of stuff. Problem is, your opponent is going to start spending 10 on things very, very soon. Decoy summons the lowest cost minion from each player's hand. So in the event that board control Warpaths and Plague Arath's here, Casey is going to pull the four cost King Ferris from hand, which is a 3-4 thanks to Floop. This would be and a good the Ark of Elysiana will be pulled from Boar's hand. So I actually think it's a 14-14 because of the uh, Emerus. Oh, oh my. That may be enough to like actually do something here. Because you're getting seven armor off the back of this as well. Casey's next draw fatigues him for five. Yep. So four can draw a brawl here? Oh, oh, oh the 312 torn! So shield block into, is there a shield slam left? Shield slam plus the hero power would clear that. Do you just war path and just make the trade? I, that's what I'm thinking. I mean. Oh, that taunt changed everything. That 14 damage is worth its weight hmm. in gold right now. Because if you choose the shield block, that means you cannot war path the board away. Nope. And I think you're much more interested in war pathing the board away right now. And Casey can actually go pretty deep into fatigue because of the hidden oasis. He's given the no-no. I think he's giving the no-no to the idea of Brawl and the Archivist Elysiana <laughs> living specifically. <laughs> this goes down to nine, goes down to six. So now Casey can just kill it on the following turn. Oh, okay, can use the microbots to, prefer, to preserve it. Seven doesn't actually make any real difference. In Still kill it. Yeah, exactly. You can still kill it with Starfall. It does make a difference in the fact that Casey has six sixes left with Hidden Oasis, though. That can be a relevant factor. So Casey has to defend himself this turn. If he plays King Ferris and it doesn't grab a taunt, that he means he dies, dies to the fatigue the plus the attack from Leosiana. Correct. So that means that he has to either Starfall or Hidden Oasis. But if he Hidden Oasis... If he hit an oasis, the same thing is true next turn because it just stays on board as a 14-1 in can, that point. You could play the Anubisath Defender with it. That's not guaranteed to live, though. Sure. So I think this is right. Yeah. Starfall, Anubisath. You take seven and take eight on your fatigue hits. So that leaves you at six health, and then you get to hit an oasis because you want to play the Ferris next turn. Whoa, bro. Bro. Number one found for Boar. I think that Restless Mummy kills a 6-6 this game. I don't think it needs to interact with a 3-5. Yeah, agree with this. Laser as well. This is a weird game. I just draw a combo minion, right? Yes, it is. Casey does not look happy. I think Boar wins. I think Boar absolutely wins now. Oh, yeah. yeah, that is solved. With the 5-3 being able to be removed off the board, Casey cannot win with a 6-6 six, six every turn from that position. Woo! That's set over to Boar. Boar picks up an all-important first win for the season as well in highly unexpected circumstances. He had 0-1 to one cards in his hands trying to deal with all the nonsense that Quest Druid could throw at you, but through a combination of like excellent recognition, that spot, 
with the uh, Warpath and the Zilliax, or where I was suggesting Warpath Zilliax, and he found the way to preserve the Warpath at the cost of leaving a 3-1 alive on the board. That was a great spot, as I said, Warpath is worth a lot more than killing a 3-1, which is all it ended up doing. That Warpath then swept an entire King Ferris board that he held onto. Like, that is very much the difference. And you can point to five or six little micro decisions, as you were talking about in his first game, that make that level of difference when you are that low on resources against what Quest Druid can throw out against you. And, and that's that's really the point that I wanted to, to go towards with that, was just how well he managed on a turn-to-turn -turn basis. Like, the macro game plan he knows. And because of the nature of the matchup... Yeah, it's kill all that stuff. Exactly. So the nature of the matchup brings it down to a micromanagement level is the most important part of that, which I think Bohr did absolutely fantastic. I mean, even better than that, he started off super aggressive, right? Push damage, push damage, push damage. And then there was that turn where we were like, do you Plague of Wrath here just to like push more damage? And Bohr rightly, again, on the macro side of things said, no, that's too much. I turned that down. I'm going to reset. My aggressive push hasn't worked out. I guess I'm just going to have to go to Dr. Boom Mad Genius plan and just hope against hope that I can find all the removal to get over the line. That's exactly what happened. All right, let's get a winner's interview here. Bora Control, can you hear us? I can hear you loud and clear. Well, congratulations on this one. Uh, a very important win for you and also a pretty impressive win uh, given all the circumstances here. I think you navigated game two pretty darn well. I'm going to leave those questions for Solid, though. I want to ask you about uh, the balance patch in this metagame. Uh, talk to me about the decks that you brought and some of the stuff perhaps that you wanted to bring but couldn't quite bring this week. So this week I brought, obviously, you saw the Druid deck and the Warrior deck. There was also Shaman that got banned, and there's an OTK Paladin as well. It was a, This was a weird week because the range of opponents' decks was really wide because anyone can think anything is good because there's not enough playtesting. So we see people with, like, Commodore Priest as even the exact same decks from last week with the Reno Mage. So these are basically just the same, the best decks that would do well for me against a field of decks. Because I'm facing two different opponents as well, Boston's fairly aggro, Casey not, I need to have a wide range of... Uh, capable uh, decks. So I, I just wanted to ask questions about your cat, but Admirable has kind of logged me, lo locked me into asking technical questions. So um, <laughs> like when, so let's talk about the Warrior game. Like you made the aggressive push to start out as I guess you're supposed to do. When that failed and it was pretty clear that it had failed, like what percentage did you put your chances of winning that game at from that point? Yeah, like the aggressive start looks nice and all, but really what really matters is just drawing boom and the clears is the most part. If you, the aggressive start does force them to like maybe waste a worthy potential, waste some resources, but he had the double nourish hand, so he could just do whatever he wanted anyway. I thought I was quite low percent. I mean, you saw what happened in that yeah. game. It was a joke. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I should never have won. What, was it a joke? I felt like you, you played it pretty darn well. <laughs> I mean, as well. I mean, yes, of course, I played it well. But like, you, blame D players. <laughs> oh, of like, course. Oh, 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 oh sorry. Of I'm so sorry That's for questioning yeah. you. Apologies. Double. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want I want to talk about uh, your thoughts on the Grandmasters changes as well. Uh, we didn't get to ask you in the opening week, uh, but now that you're here, I know that you are one of the uh, more prominent, outspoken players about the changes and your happiness on them. So I want to get your thoughts on the changes to see from season one to season two and what you think about it so far. Yeah, so specialist to this conquest format, I'm very happy with the changes. Given the constraints of like best of three, this is one of the best things we could do as well. It's just changing up the system a bit. For for specialists, people were just submitting the same night cards the next week, no games of practice, playing auto chess and whatever. Now I'm having an hour long conversation about what I should be banning, protecting, and queuing first. And it feels much more like I'm actually playing competitive Hearthstone now compared to the last season. 100% agree. Don't really have much more to add to that. Borio, any final thoughts for us before we let you go? Um, uh, not really. I'm, yeah, hopefully 2-2 two -two this week, playing Boston later on. Nice. Yeah, have a good day, guys. All right. I'll look forward to my uh, my Discord essay on, on how bad our casting <laughs> was after this. For... <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't seen it yet, so we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, so I said I'll wait for it. Hey, you have to watch it back yeah, first. Yeah, okay, honestly. Okay, I, okay. I never get the essays, and you know they're welcome on my side as well. I always love hearing your thoughts. Thank you, thank yeah, you very much for your time, for. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for your time, and congratulations on your win. Looking forward to your match against Boston.